I love our church here at Royal Oak. Um, you know, the, the, uh, Jesus said, I, I, my prayer for you is that you will be as one as I and the Father are one. And I sense that that's the spirit we have here in our church. We respect each other, we love each other, and uh, we, we're like a family, aren't we, in a very real sense. And I, I hope that if you're visiting this morning, you will sense that as well, that you'll sense that Royal Oak is a place where you can belong, a place where you feel at home, that it's a family for you, and that you'll want to uh, come and join us uh, each Sabbath and worship. Um, I've been asked to just draw your attention once again to our survey um, that you were handed out as you came in. We believe that um, our church should be, as that says, about bringing people to Jesus, growing people in Jesus, and sending people out in Jesus' name. And we can only do that if we know what you want to do, if you know what, or who you are, and what you can, can provide or offer in service to God. So I'd encourage you, please, if you have a moment and you haven't done it already, please fill in your survey and hand it out as you, to our deacons as you, as you leave after the service this morning. I'll see if this works. There we go. What do you, when you see these words, creation and evolution, what goes through your mind? Um, there was a time when I was quite indifferent to the creation-evolution debate. It didn't, didn't really sort of engage me. And uh, I was then, after a while, I became intimidated by the, the debate and the arguments. And then I became unsure. So I want to take a, a quick st uh, straw poll this morning. Uh, I want you to put, raise your hands, please. If you think the creation-evolution debate is important. Very good. Thank you. Raise your hands if you think it's not important, that really the only important thing is that we believe in God and trust in Jesus. Please put your hand up. Okay, very good. Uh, raise your hands if you just don't know or can't decide. Okay, there's a few. So it's a good thing, I think, that we, we talk about this this morning. I want to have a quick prayer first, though. Let's bow our heads. Eh? Gracious Father, as we handle this very difficult topic, very controversial topic, we pray, Lord, that uh, you will clear our minds and help us, please, in our understanding. I have done a preparation, Father, but it's now up to you to deliver and to shine and to uh, be the one that our congregation this morning hears. May, may they hear your voice and see your face, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, is it important? 1 Peter 3.15. I wonder if you can read this with me, please. Ready? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you, a reason for the hope that, you, that is in you with meekness and fear. If you look carefully at that text, it's in two parts. What's the first part? Sanctify. Sanctify God. And the second part is be ready to give a defense, right? Be, be ready to be prepared to explain. So the first part is believe in God. And the second part is know why you believe in God. Does that make sense? It's not enough for us to just believe in God and say, well, I believe in God. I don't need the evidence. I can just believe in what God says. This thing is playing up on me. Or it's, my head's the wrong shape. Um, I'm going to try and bend it a little bit. Is that okay? Okay. Is that better? Yeah. So it's not enough to believe in God without the evidence. We do, I think, need to believe in God and have evidence for it. Otherwise, it's blind faith. We may as well believe in Santa or the Tooth Fairy if we don't need the evidence. So I think it's important from that point of view. This text tells us that it's not enough for us just to believe. We need to be prepared to explain. So why is it important that we at least know 
about the creation-evolution debate? Well, the creation-evolution debate is primarily about our origins, where we come from, and how we got here. Um, so it's important from that point of view. If we can't trust the creation account, the, the beginnings of the Bible, how can we trust the rest of it? The creation account, Genesis, is foundational for the rest of the Bible. And when we see God uh, mentioned in other parts of the Bible, it's often in the context of this is God, the God of Israel, the creator, the maker of heaven and earth, and so on. So it's, it's a part of reference for who God is, that he's the creator. And so if we don't believe in the creation account, or if, if we believe what others say, that it's just allegorical, that it's just a parable, a way of teaching a lesson, if, we, if some, some teach that uh, God created, but he created through evolution, that each day is a million years or you know, thousands of years, if we believe that account, then we, we, can't have, we don't have a basis for the rest of the Bible. Make sense? Um, how can we answer our children when they ask us about evolution if we don't have ready answers for what we believe in? Um, last week, I mentioned to my mum, I visited her and we had a talk, and I mentioned to her that I was preaching about uh, creation and evolution this week. And she told me about my brother Jack. In fourth form, he came home from school and asked her, is evolution true? And she said, I, I didn't know what to tell him. I had no explanation other than to believe in God. So it's important for us to understand or to know, that get involved in what this debate is all about. Uh, our origins impo are important because... Um, of, of the wider issues of, oh man, excuse me, now it's getting caught in my belt. <laughs> Louis, you better fix this for me, please, mate. It's important for us, I hope we can cut this out from the camera. <laughs> this is what happens when you try to do it yourself. Got to leave it to the professionals. Thank you, Louis. This is what it must be like for rich people to have people dress them, eh? I like it. Oh, I'll put my jacket back on. Okay. Can you tell yet that I'm nervous? I'm not nervous because of the topic. I'm nervous because I'm talking, I'm speaking on behalf of God. I'm representing, if you like, I'm representing him to the congregation this morning. So it's a, it's a big responsibility. Thank you, Louis. I was going to give him a hand, but no, we better not. It's important for us to understand where we come from because it also governs, or it, it's the basis for our morality. Um, if there is no God... There is abs no absolute truth, no absolute morality, there's no absolute ethics, and everything is relative. If God made us and he's the boss, he owns us, he has the right to make the rules, and we can either accept or reject those rules, that's our choice. But if God did not make us, if we got here by random chance and necessity, by natural selection and so on, then no one owns us and we can make our own rules. Do you see the difference? So it's very important that we, we stay engaged in the creation-evolution debate. There are people that are abandoning their faith because they're being deceived by the um, evolution and the science basis for evolution or the theory that's behind that. <coughs> so this morning, I want to pursue the idea that not all science is good science. And I want to share with you a, a framework that will help us understand that. What's at the core of the issue of evolution and creation? Well, at the core is the choice that we make. 
and the choice we make is based on our world view. Now, what's a world view? A world view is how you view the world based on what you believe. Um, for example, put your hand up, raise your hand, if this morning on your way to church, you feared that you would be attacked by dinosaurs. Anyone? It's your worldview that dinosaurs don't exist in our time. So you're not influenced by that. Your, your, your worldview is determined by what you believe. If you believe that God is the creator and the ultimate truth and the ultimate judge, then you will believe that there is a, a judgment and a consequence to our actions. That's your worldview, a Christian worldview. If you, believe, if you don't believe in God and you believe that you are a free agent, free to use your own will, your own way to please yourself, that governs your worldview as well. So worldviews are very, very important and are at the core of this issue. Uh, a point to make, though, the scientific community, in the scientific community, there are Christian scientists and atheist scientists as well. So it's not the science that separates them, it's their worldview. And uh, I wish I could share with you all the material that I've watched on YouTube from Christian scientists who argue the point really, really strongly. And I'd recommend uh, two in particular, there are many others, but two in particular are Professor John Lennox from Oxford University, the same university as Richard Dawkins. And in fact, he's debated Richard Dawkins and, in my view, uh, won the debate. He had a debate at Oxford and a debate at the Natural Museum. And the one in the Natural Museum, Richard Dawkins had to concede a few points. But John Lennox, Professor John Lennox, and he says the best way to remember his name is to think of, think of the Beatle, John Lennon, and... Uh, change his name to John Lennox. Uh, that, that's one resource. The other one is uh, astrophysicist Jason Lyle. Both are Christians, not Adventist, but they're, they're, they're very strong apologists. And they come from a, a scientific background. So, yeah, they're, they're very good resources, and I, I can recommend them. Okay, so what is science? Uh, science is a method... So, I don't know if you can read that, but science is a method to study the natural world through ex ex experimentation, exploration, and testing to determine the truth about something. I've summarized several definitions into this one definition that I'm reading out to you. But it's important for us not just to define science in terms of the scientific world, but to understand the principles that come behind science or, or on which science is built. And the first principle I bring to your attention that is that science seeks the truth. That's very, very important. Science seeks truth. If science did not seek truth, it would not have a basis for any, um, for any of, the, of the work that scientists do. Science is based on evidence. Our faith also needs to be based on evidence. And it's important that it's based on evidence, otherwise science doesn't work. Science focuses on... Um, finding a cause for the effects that we see. An example would be, in the past, people have said, the gods are unhappy with us when there's lightning. Science comes along and says, well, that's the, that's the effect is lightning, but with a bit of uh, study and understanding of weather patterns and static electricity, we find that the cause of lightning is the buildup and discharge of electrical charge. So they find the cause for an effect. You understand? Um, but science does have limitations. Um, I've tried to put on here the idea in my mind of where science uh, is limited. So we've got, I'll put up three circles. One is science, the other is humanities, and the third is the psyche or ethics. And these are general fields of study. So in science you would have uh, scientific uh, research into physics, chemistry, biology, and all the other sciences. In humanities, you would have art, music, philosophy, uh, religion or theology is put into that, that field at universities. And then your psyche or your ethics 
are things that, uh, like law or how we, um, how we choose morality and right and so forth. But can you see that science is limited in its application? It's objective, not subjective. So if you understand that objective are things that uh, we, can, we can say are true, subjective are things that are based on what we think, our views, our opinions, um, our biases. Those are subjective things. Science is very objective. It's got to be black or white, or you can't call it scientific. Um, Science is also amoral, which means it doesn't, bo it doesn't trouble itself or concern itself with uh, mor uh, morality or issues that are of the conscience. Science is purely about discovering things that are in the natural world. So in that sense, science is limited in what it can do. And that's very important because often uh, scientists, atheistic, atheistic scientists will make claims that are not scientific claims. Um, in his recent book uh, called The Grand Design, Professor Stephen Hawking uh, made the claim that because there are laws such as gravity, the universe can create itself. It can and has created itself was his statement. Now you think about that. How can the laws of science that are limited to the natural world that we see, how can that create the universe? It just doesn't make sense. And uh, Professor John Lennox makes a very good argument for that in, in, uh, in, in, in how uh, rubbish or nonsense is still nonsense, even if spoken by very smart people. All right. And finally, science discovers and uncovers the natural world, science does not create. Now, if you understand what I mean, science can uncover the process of, uh, of how things are made. Say, for example, biofuel. Science can take the material, the plant material, it knows the process, and so it can apply the process for us to make biofuel to run our diesel trucks and so forth. So science can take the material and use it and discover how that's done, but science does not create that. So then, how do we reconcile science with our Christian worldview? I, I sense that there's a, there's a struggle there for us to try and understand how can we counter the logic and the, and the rationality of science while our, the basis for what we believe is purely what the Bible says. It's all faith. It's faith-based. So I've developed a, a model that I've called the <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I've called the dartboard model. And at the center, uh, it's a dartboard because as we get closer to the center, the score goes up, truth becomes more evident and so forth. So the more we work from outside to, inside, to the inside, we get closer and closer to the truth. So at the, at the core of our dartboard, I've put truth. And you'll notice that in the dartboard, there are concentric rings that go from the inside to the outside. And so in the first concentric ring, the one closest to the center, I've put the title empirical science. Now, empirical just means, the word empirical just means that this has been tested, it's been tried, and can be trusted. Um, so that's the, the one closest to the, to the center, I'll call that empirical science. The next ring, I've called that experimental or exploratory science. This is the science of things like the Large Hadron Collider, uh, the Hubble uh, Space tele Telescope, um, uh, cancer research comes into that area, um, and so on. So in empirical science, uh, I, I would put things like uh, planes. You know, we fly in planes trusting that that science is going to work. It's the things that engineers concern themselves with, and chemists and so forth. In the empirical science would be doctors, and we have a few doctors in our church, uh, medicine and so on. Um, other things that fall into the empirical science arena are things like parachutes and safety belts. We need to trust these things and we need to have tested them. Bridges and skyscrapers, these are all empirical science. Now, in the outermost ring of our dartboard model, 
I've put the, oops, that was a bit slow, theoretical or hypothetical science. These are the sciences of ideas, of um, opinions, things that we think might happen because of what we find in empirical science or experimental science. So when they fired up the Large Hadron Collider, I think about two years ago, they were expecting to find the Higgs boson particle, which would suggest to them that this happened in the Big Bang. So they were looking for the Higgs particle when they fired it up two years ago, and they said, oh, it's going to take about five years to analyze the data, but they weren't going to find the Higgs boson particle. They, in fact, when they fired it up, they actually had more questions than answers from, from firing it up. So they were never, I, from the Higgs boson, I think they're still in the air, experimental exploratory area. So let's build this up uh, some more. Our dartboard has spokes that go from the inside to outside. And for the spokes, I've picked on the, the topics that we discuss or we, we study, the fields of study. And so we, we have the, the three basic or the main ones are physics, chemistry, and biology. Physics is the study of the physical world. So it involves things like matter and energy, space and time, uh, gravity and that sort of stuff. Chemistry, chemistry is the study of the elemental world. The elements, the chemicals, things, how, how things combine into compounds and so forth. And obviously biology is the study of living things, plants and animals and microorganisms and so on. So that then is our dartboard model. Can you, do you understand that? Can you see that? All right. I'm going to start, uh, suggest some things that I want you to tell me where they fit on this dartboard model. All right? So where do you think cruise ships would fit on that? Experimental? If cruise ships were experimental, I wouldn't go on a cruise. <laughs> Empirical? Why? <laughs> Very good. There are hundreds of cruise ships around the world and everybody trusts. So cruise, the cruise ships are empirical science. They've tested and proven and we use them. How about space travel? Empirical? Put your hand up if it's empirical to you. Thank you. Experimental, exploratory? Thank you. Theoretical, hypothetical? I would put my hand up for all three. Because space travel is possible in all three. We do it now. We're experimenting to do it more. And theoretically, science says we can travel into outer space, into Mars in eight months and so forth, in the theoretical, hypothetical science area. So it's important to know that you know, we're not limited into one area of science uh, until we come to things like evolution and the Big Bang, and we'll come to that in a minute. Um, what about fossils? Empirical, who says empirical? Who says hypothetical? <laughs> it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because fossils are here and now. We can pick them up and... Uh, did you hear about the, the lady, the, the doctor, that um, found a Tyrannosaurus Rex bone? And she went to clean it up with some acid. And the bone, the mineral dissolved away and she was left with material that looked like blood vessels and cells and tissues. And she said, I can't explain it. It's 70 million years old. 70 million, 70 million a million years old, uh, it's just not possible. She says that herself. And yet, because of her worldview, she's going to try and find an answer to explain how that survived that. Okay, what about uh, Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, the painting? Where would you put that on there? Say again? Who says empirical? Okay. Who says experimental exploratory? Who says hypothetical? Okay. Who says it doesn't belong there? <laughs> Very good. It's, it's a, Mona Lisa is subjective art. It's, it's not something that belongs in the scientific arena. So it's important for us when we look at the creation evolution argument or debate 
that we, we differentiate out of what we are told, the subjective material, from the objective material. That's very important. Okay, what about gravity? Where does that fit in this? Empirical? Absolutely. Gravity is empirical. We see it today. It's a fact of nature. In fact, we call it a law because it's immutable. We can't change gravity. Um, my kids are probably sick of me saying this, but I have a, a fantasy in my mind that one day I'll be able to control gravity. There are four universal forces in the world. There's electromagnetism, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, and gravity. And we've been able to manipulate the first three and use gravity for um, generating electricity, you know, through hydro dams. But we can't control gravity. But I, I wish I could. Because if I could, I could generate electricity without fuel. Can you imagine what that would mean? I could fly without power to push me along or to lift me up. I could do so much with gravity. I could make large hospitals that I could move from disaster to disaster and help people. But after thinking about it for a while, I thought, I don't really want to discover that. Because as soon as the world knows that, as soon as mankind knows how to do that, we would turn it around and use it as a weapon. We would use it for evil as well as good. And gravity is one of those things that are, 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 they are a God prerogative. Only God can do that, right? So it's a fantasy I have, but it's on the back burner because I know I'm not God and there's nothing I can do about that. What about evolution? Where are we going to put evolution on there? Is it empirical, experimental, or theoretical? Theoretical. Who says empirical? Are there any atheists here? I'm joking. I would suggest that there are parts of evolution that are empirical, and there are parts of evolution that are theoretical. Let me explain. And, and Dr. Georgia Purden uh, put me onto this idea, or it was her idea. <clears throat> In evolution, there are two types of evolution. One is adaptive evolution, and the other is transformational evolution. And they don't talk about it as two separate evolutions. When, when evolutionists talk about it, they combine the two together. For example, when you talk about uh, um, Darwin, Darwin's, what they call Darwin's finches, when Charles Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands, and he found that on some islands, finches have stronger, shorter beaks, and others had longer, slender beaks. And he put this down to um, the fruit or nuts that these birds had to live with on these islands. And they said, well, because these birds are adapting to their environment, uh, given enough time, these birds could transform into something else. Now, you see how they take the adaptive evolution and, and use it, and combine it with transformational evolution, and then push out a hypothesis. They speculate beyond that to a conclusion that doesn't fit the facts. Adaptive evolution I know is true. I'm an example of that. When I first came from Samoa when I was 10, I could play in the sun all day and not burn in the sun. Now I burn as fast as anybody else. My body has adjusted, has adapted to the climate and the seasons in New Zealand. And you are examples of, of adaptive evolution. We can see adaptation within the kinds. You look at dogs. Dogs adapt based on their climate that they're in. If it's cold, dogs have long hair. If it's warm, they have short hair. And uh, that's determined by the environment they're in. They adapt, so that's adaptive evolution. What's transformational evolution then? Right. Dog changes into a cat or dinosaurs change into birds. That's transformational evolution. That's in the theoretical, hypothetical science area. It's not true. There are no supporting evidences for theoretical or hypothetical science. In the fossil record, there's nothing that points to theoretical or hypothetical. Fossils of birds 
Uh, the birds we have now, we have fossils of birds. Um, crustacean, crustacean, shellfish we have now, <laughs> there are fossils of shellfish fish from years ago. In fact, the fossil record speaks volumes about a global catastrophe. It, talks about the, it really tells us, if you, if you have the worldview to look at through the right eyes, it tells us that there was a, a global flood. Um, if evolution, transformational evolution was true, we should be able to find in the fossil records um, this. You've seen that picture before, how man ascends into who he is now. We have millions of records of monkeys and ape-like creatures in the fossil record. We have millions of records, well, I say millions, I don't know it's millions, but there's a lot, um, of records of man in the fossil records. Um, but if there's this long period of transition between the two, there should be millions or lots of transitional forms. There should be uh, animals that look something like a dinosaur and something like a bird, and you know you see scales changing to feathers. And, and there's um, David Menton, Dr. David Menton. He was a professor in anatomy. He has short lectures on YouTube about how it's impossible for scales to change to feathers. It's just anatomically impossible because scales are actually part of the skin. They're not separate like um, feathers are separate part of it, like the hair is on us. The feathers come out of follicles, whereas scales are part of the skin. So this, we should have lots of those. Okay, where do we put black holes in this? <laughs> out there. <laughs> black hole... Hypothetical, okay? There's no testable, um, it's not testable, we can't go out there and test for it. It's not scientific, because it's, it's not a fact, it's hypothetical. It requires faith to believe in black holes. What about dark matter? Hypothetical. We can't go out there and test it. We can't prove it, that it's a fact. It takes faith to accept dark matter. Big Bang? Theoretical. Noah's Ark? Empirical? Some say it's empirical. Would you say empirical? Put your hand up, please. Who says it's theoretical? I would say it's theoretical. We can't go there and find it and test it. Some may have found it, and that's why they put their hand up under empirical. But it's theoretical. It needs faith. It requires faith to us for us to believe. It depends on our worldview, what we believe in. I've put it in theoretical. If you want to put it in empirical because you know something else, great. I'd like to hear from you as well. Um, Jesus. <laughs> if your worldview is that of a Christian, you would put Jesus everywhere. He's the truth. He's empirical science. He is experimental science. Is he's theoretical science. All the science we do as Christians is in the context of Jesus as creator. True? If you are an atheist and don't believe in Jesus, you wouldn't have Jesus on this model. Make sense? You would exclude Jesus from this model. So, there's so much that I could share with you or, or that I wanted to share, but we're going to run out of time. So, I'm going to go through uh, what I call the evolution delusion. And I've called that the evolution delusion in uh, recognition of Richard Dawkins calling his book The God Delusion. This is the evolution delusion. How we can uh, argue uh, against evolution. And I think we need to be able to do that. Evolution says life can come from non-life. That is not true. We do not see any evidence or any science or any natural means for life to come from non-life. Life can only come from life. We see that every day. Transformational evolution is not supported by any evidence. There is absolutely no evidence for transformational evolution. We have evidence for adaptive evolution, and we see adaptive evolution today, and in our day-to-day, -day, but there's no evidence for transformational evolution. Evolution 
as transformational evolution violates the law of, of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. Now, you might have heard this bandied around a bit, but entropy is just a measure of disorderliness. And from an engineering point of view, it's, you see things that have a high energy level. If left to themselves, they naturally go to a low energy level. If you put a cup of coffee or Milo on your table, that will gradually get cold. It's going from a high level of orderliness or high level of energy to a low level of orderliness or energy. So entropy is a measure, measure of disorderliness. The higher the entropy, the more disorderly something is. If you drop a vase and it breaks, you've taken it from a high uh, level of order to a very, sorry, a high level of order to a high level of disorder. So that's what entropy is. So in essence, entropy says everything is going to decay from order to disorder. Evolution says you start with disorder and you go to order. You see the difference? So evolution is breaking every, uh, or every part of the entropy law. Now, <clears throat> Entropy can be reversed by adding energy. Okay? Um, one guy argued that if you put some dough into an oven and don't do anything, that thing doesn't change. But if you add heat in the form of, or if you add energy in the form of heat and you cook it, you get nice cookies. Okay? Uh, somebody else argued that energy that you add into a, a system can also destroy. The energy needs to be controlled. In other words, the energy that the Japanese threw at Pearl Harbor to start the second, or the Americans getting involved in the Second World War, that energy did a lot of destruction. That didn't reverse entropy, it made it worse. And then the energy that the Americans threw at the Japanese to end the Second World War, that did a lot of destruction as well. But there is a natural process for reversing entropy that we see every day. And that's things like well, anything that's alive, things that take energy out of the fuel and grow like plants. You and I are examples of reverse in, in entropy to a point because we still get old and die. But we can reverse entropy only by involving energy and by involving intelligence. And that's a very important point. Just ending energy is not enough. It needs to be intelligent controlled energy back into the entropy, uh, back into the, to the entropy system. So, um, evolution violates the law of entropy, the second law that says entropy is always growing. You know, they say that um, one of the reasons they say that the universe is expanding is that the universe is getting colder. And it's getting colder because as it expands, it has more space for the heat to dissipate and therefore gets colder. One of the laws of, of, of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, just changed. So you can burn timber from matter into energy, heat and light, and you're left with dust or, or, or uh, residue. Yeah, so evolution definitely violates the law of entropy. Um, evolution is based on the idea of natural selection that through um, genetic mutations or changes in our genes, we can develop better minds or better bodies and so on. Well, that only works if the genes already exist. Natural selection, there is no natural process whereby um, more information can be added to the gene pool. In fact, natural sele selection takes information out of the gene pool. So evolution, the delusion that it's going to add more, there's no evidence for that. Um, evolution is, ra or rather racist thinking, the ideas of, of superior races, is founded on an evolutionary theory. Let me show you this slide. That's the front cover of Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species. If we take a closer look, can you read what that says? I'll read it to you. On the origin of species, by means of natural selection, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. We don't get that second part or the, the subtitle um, quoted very often. 
But the whole idea of Darwin's theory is that man has evolved at different levels, and that's why we get a difference in, in, in races, and that's why we have superior races, which the, the Marxists and Karl Marx and Hitler used for, to justify what they were doing. Did you know, and my brother told me this, so I'm, I'm quoting him, not the original source. Did you know that in the 50s, it was still legal to shoot aboriginals in Australia because they were considered an inferior species? Now, I see frowns and think, nah, that can't be true. I'll leave it for you to, to find on the internet or a more reliable source. But that's what I've been told. The evidence, as I've said before, the evidence we find in the fossil record and elsewhere points to a cataclysmic global event, a global flood. Now, here's another thing that I find very interesting, that the evolution debate hides behind millions of years. They can't explain it, so they say, well, give it millions of years, and that could possibly be the reason. It's still hypothetical in its nature, it's not empirical, it's not tested and true. Now, the Big Bang del delusion, um, it's hypothetical science through and through. And why is that? Because we can't go out there and test it. We can't prove what they say about uh, cosmology and the Big Bang and so forth. Um, I find it quite interesting that they say we, we know this happens or we know that happens, okay? They, they quote it as though it's empirical science, but it's not. It's still all theoretical or exploratory science at best. It also interests me that when we look out there, we can apparently know what happens at stars and, and galaxies millions of light years away. And yet we're not sure how many planets there are in our own solar system. I, you know, to me, that, that casts a, a rather sort of interesting thought that we could, we could know all these things about planets that are, you know, four billion light years away, and yet we don't know, we can't see what's happening in our own solar system, the planets that are closest to us. I hope you find that fascinating as well. Um, yeah, just... To me, it just seems like there's something, something's happening uh, and people are painting the picture that they want us to see. We see f pictures of stars and planets and so forth, of colored pictures. We know that's not photographed. We know that someone's painted that or created that on computer to help them deliver the message that they want to, to deliver. It, it's almost as if um, there is a, a religion, a religion of... Uh, magic and mystery, and there are high priests that push the religion, and the high priests tell you what this religion is all about, and you can't go and find this religion for yourself. That's what the Big Bang is all about. It appeals to our imagination and our sense of adventure because we feel that we've discovered everything on this planet. Let's go discover now what's out there. Um, it's really only um, imagination. The observations we see in uh, cosmology, that's empirical. We can see the colors and so forth, and we can take that color and say, well, we know what this looks like from our observation uh, point on the ground or in the space stations or the Hubble uh, Space Telescope. That's empirical data. But how we interpret it is the theory. That's the part that we should question. That's the part we should separate out and say, no, that's someone's interpretation of it. It's not necessarily the truth, even if they sell it as such. As evolution hides behind millions of years, Big Bang hides behind astronomical distances and millions of years. We can't go out there to test their theories about Big Bang and so forth. Okay, what about God? We've, we've uh, given evolution and Big Bang a bit of a hiding. What some of the scientific hints to a creator God? How can we use science to say that there is a God? Well, the first, the first thing I'd like to say is the fact that we have reason should be reason enough. But if that's not enough, 
there is transcendence. Transcendence is this idea that the natural world is the natural world and that's where it stays. That's where science goes. But we know from our own personal experiences and the atheists know from their experiences of life that there is a transcendence beyond the natural world. Let me ask you this. I want you to point to the area on your body where you have your brain. Do that now, please. Very, very good. Okay. Now, I want you to point to the area in your body where you have your mind. <laughs> Same area. Okay. But can you see the difference? Can you see the difference? The brain is something that's tangible. We can put probes in and MRI, and when we think of things, certain parts of the brain fire up. But you can't do that with the mind. The mind transcends the brain. You see my point? There is the natural things we can study, then there are things that are outside the natural things we can study that transcend. Like art and music transcend science, just in that subset that I had before. There are things that are outside science that science cannot handle or doesn't concern itself with. So for us, the first thing we need to say is what we have here on this world, naturally, is not all that there is here. There is room for transcendence. There is room for understanding. Here's another example. Um, what do the words, what do the letters um, G-O-D mean? G-O-D. God, right? The letters themselves can be just black marks on a white page. They are empirical. They're there. But they have no meaning unless we put them in that order and unless you read them and can interpret what they mean, right? There is transcendence beyond what those letters are. If we change the letters round and make them D-O-G, -G, what does that spell? Dog. Same letters, different order, different meaning. There is a transcendence. There's something beyond just the letters on the page, okay? Um, the, the other th things that transcend the natural world are concepts of morality, of good and evil, right and wrong. Um, rational intelligibility of the universe. This is really more a scientific sort of view that as, a, as, a, as scientists or as engineers, we see that the world is rational, is intelligible. They've estimated that, or somebody has said, that the rationality or intelligibility of the world, the world is so finely tuned, and not just the world, but the whole universe is so finely tuned that it's like having 200 dials on a board and each one is set to very fine tolerances. And if you change just one to 15 decimal places, so that's a, a zero, a point, a decimal point in 15 places, and then ch just change that digit on the 15th part, 15th line, you'll change everything. Life will die or life will, you know, will collapse into the sun or something like that. So it's very, very finely tuned. Um, scientific evidence for God, I think this is probably the, one of the greatest evidences we've discovered, is DNA. DNA itself does not create life. DNA is the instructions for life. It's like having a book on how to build a car, but the book doesn't create the car. But you need the book for the car. In the same way, DNA uh, tells us how, or tells the, the body how to make the different parts of the body. Um, there was a, a guy, who's, he's dead now, Anthony Flew. I'm not sure if he was a doctor of anything, but Anthony Flew was a very um, militant atheist and spoke against uh, creationism and against religion and so on. But in his later years, he changed his mind. And they asked him, why did you change your mind? Why have you become a theist rather than an atheist? And he said, well, because I looked at the DNA and found that the DNA tells me that there is information there. And information immediately tells me that there is an intellect. He still didn't believe in God, but he believed in a, in a force that outside of just the natural world that he lives in. So DNA is very, very important. 
I wonder, can you tell me what this says? Who can tell me? Anyone? God is love. Who else? Okay, very good. We see these, and we may not fully understand them, but we know that each of these lines represents intellect. We cannot have these letters and have them mean anything unless there is an intellect behind it to create it. So we've got Chinese, French, Finnish, Russian, Samoan, Korean, Japanese, and Indonesian. I've tried to include all our family here, but there was no Fijian, so sorry Fijians. Um, I looked at the Malaysian, and it... Uh, oh, no, that's next. <laughs> and uh, for the Malaysians, they, they, the, the translation was God is love. So they, have the same, they say the same thing. But can you see that it takes intellect first to create that? It takes intellect to interpret it. Language is intellect. And you'll notice that in the, when I talked about the dartboard model, I included biology, chemistry, and physics, but I didn't include maths. Any ideas why? Maths is a language. Think about it. English, Chinese, Japanese, they are languages both written and spoken. Maths is a language that's written and spoken. Language conveys concepts and ideas. And maths, like music, conveys ideas and concepts beyond culture and, and spoken languages. A Chinese scientist that doesn't speak Russian, and a Russian scientist that doesn't speak Chinese can both understand the maths. It's a language that they both can, can read and understand. Okay. Man's intellect. We don't often pick on this, but I believe one of the strongest evidences for God's existence is that we are made in His image. We have an intellect that is above and beyond. It transcends the natural world. So our, our intellect, I believe, is a sign that there is a God that created us with the ability to understand Him, to comprehend Him. So, in conclusion, we have nothing to fear from science. We can explain science away using science, if you understand what I mean. Using reason, using logic. We have nothing to fear from science. We need to encourage our children to engage in science. So, and, and, and so they have science and Christianity hand in hand. They can understand that they can be Christian scientists or Christian engineers, that they can bring the scientific world into their worldview and lose nothing. The, science, the atheistic scientists and atheistic engineers, they can't accept Christ or Christianity or creation. So they're limited in their worldview. Whereas Christians, we can... Uh, embrace science and learn from it how God created this wonderful world we live in and the wonderful bodies we have. We need to recognize the differences between theoretical, experimental, and empirical science. We need to pick apart what the media says and, and de de decide or discern for ourselves what parts are good and what parts are not worthy of, of keeping. And we need to be prepared to be explained, to, to explain. As uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says, we need to sanctify God. So in other words, firstly, we need to sanctify God in our heart. We need to believe in God, but we also need to be prepared to explain why we believe in God. And finally, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 21 and 22. Test all things. That's why it's important to get involved in the creation-evolution debate. We need to test all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Thank you for listening.